Okay, so we're going to start our unit on ancient Greece, and there is a lot of information to cover here. There's been tons of research done on ancient Greece. We have tons of artifacts, tons of ruins, tons of historical information. So I decided I'm gonna chop this up a little bit. So you should have already watched the video uh, on the prehistoric Aegean, and this relates very directly to ancient Greece. So if you haven't watched that one yet, go back and watch that one. Um, but today we're just gonna kind of get into it, okay? So what do you know about ancient Greece? You are probably familiar at this time. I tend to ask you that question at the beginning of a lot, a lot of these lectures because a lot of people in Art History One have more familiarity with some of the subjects that we uh, talk about than they think they do. Like when we were talking about um, ancient Egypt, for example, a lot of you knew about the Sphinx, a lot of you knew about pyramids, that kind of thing. So I like to start off and, and ask people what you know about ancient Greece. And some things you know because you just watched the prehistoric Aegean lecture. And like I said, there's some there's tons of influence and, and relationship there because that is what happened before this period, right? That's the Neolithic that comes before the ancient for this region of, uh, of the world. A lot of my students in recent years know kind of a lot about ancient Greece. And one of the reasons for that is this book series called Percy Jackson. Um, I love these books. I read these books with my older uh, kiddo who uh, really liked them. And uh, I think they're pretty fantastic books actually. So if you, some of you have probably read these. If you haven't, they're kind of fun. I, I recommend it. But basically they, they involve all of the um, mythology and the gods and goddesses, so they bring a lot of that in. The other component, and I talked about this a little bit in the prehistoric Aegean uh, period, is uh, video games. Lots of video games have characters that are either directly from mythology or, or are related to Greek mythology. So a lot of people have familiarity there as well. There's also, of course, lots of movies. I talked about Clash of the Titans last time, the 80s version, because I am a child of the 80s and I love the 80s version that's you know, really bad and cheesy and has a stop motion um, special effects. Uh, it's, it's pretty great. I still advocate watching that version. I know there's a newer one that's come out, but anyway, a lot of you know more about this subject than you maybe think you do. And uh, I also get people who are like, well, I read the Percy Jackson books or I, I play whatever video game. So I know some of the names and stuff, but I don't really know that much about them. And that's where you're you're probably a little bit wrong because a lot of the things that become weapons or become storylines or become different kinds of um, elements in those stories in video games in movies in uh, books come directly from the artwork come directly from the artifacts that we know of so you probably know a little bit more about this stuff than you think you do okay you know me and maps we've got to get on a map and see where we're talking about so you remember last time we were talking, we were on Crete most of the time, right? You can't quite see Crete on this map. It's a little bit south. It's kind of right down at the bottom there and it's the largest island in the Aegean. But we know where we are. This is the Aegean Sea where we were last time. You can see the Cyclades, the islands right there. You can see uh, Mycenae, which we talked about them quite a lot, right? So they're kind of the ancestors of the ancient Greeks. So we know where we are, right? One of the things about Greece at this time is we have Greek cultures outside of what we now know as Greece. So at this time, Greece isn't a, really a, a thing, like as, as a unit as we know it now. So we have the Greek culture and it's a whole bunch of city-states. So it's a bunch of little uh, cities that are very powerful, that have their own government, have their own king, have all of that. But culturally, they share some of the religious elements and some of the other interests. We also have um, Greek civilization happening in Italy, which is a little bit confusing, I know, but what we now know as Italy, there uh, are also city-states that relate to the Greek mainland there as well. Okay, so we kind of know where we are. We have a, a grounding here. Um, one of the things that uh, people tend to know when I teach this class, the seated version of this class, oftentimes someone will say Mount Olympus. Um, and I will confess something to you. I didn't know Mount Olympus was a real place until I was in college. <laughs> I thought Mount Olympus was just a fictitious place made up in Greek mythology, because in Greek mythology, Mount Olympus is where uh, the gods and goddesses live. 
not all of them, but most of them, right? Uh, it's an actual place, which I, again, it's sort of silly that I didn't know that till uh, pretty late, but Mount Olympus is a real place. It's the highest mountain in Greece. This is a picture of it. Um, and the ancient Greeks believed that there, many of their gods and goddesses lived there. It's a real place in Greece. You can visit it. It exists, okay? So what I want to do, because the gods and goddesses are so culturally important to all of these Greek city-states, um, and a lot of what we have left of their culture in terms of the actual artifacts and also the writing um, relate to their gods and goddesses, okay? So we have lots of plays and epic poems and things written at this time that tell the stories of their heroes and their monsters and their gods and goddesses. And then we have lots of statues of their gods and goddesses and of their heroes and of some normal people. We'll look at some of those as well. And then we have the ruins of their temples, which were dedicated to their gods and goddesses. So I think it's important to have a general understanding of who their gods and goddesses were first, so that we know who we're talking about and what we're looking at, okay? We did this with Egypt too. Remember, I went through and told you about the different deities of the uh, Egyptian religion. So we're gonna do that. That's how we're gonna start off. Um, and again, I've, I'm gonna chunk this lecture up into parts. So, um, there'll be a couple of these, but if you need to go back and review the gods and goddesses, they relate to, to each of the parts of this lecture. So first of all, let's talk about Zeus. He's here on the right. Um, so you'll notice on these slides, parenthetically, I've put the Roman name. So the Roman Empire comes after the Greeks. There's some overlap, of course. Um, and the Romans take the Greek gods and goddesses and rename them, generally speaking. Okay, but they keep some of the same temples, they keep the same practices, they have the same attributes, that kind of thing. So Zeus is the Greek name for the king of the gods and his Roman name is Jupiter. And he's here on the right. So he's the king of the gods, he rules the sky, he's the god of the sky realm. So he has uh, thunder and lightning bolts and things like this. And uh, so he is often shown with a lightning bolt or with his staff, sometimes he has an eagle uh, kind of representing his connection to the sky. And he's always depicted as um, having this white gray beard and longish hair, very curly, but also even though he's gray headed, he's generally like totally cut. He's super ripped for some reason. So he's often very muscular, but kind of uh, has a big older looking beard. So it's, it's a little confusing, but that's Zeus. Zeus's wife is Hera, so Hera is here on the left, uh, and her Roman name is Juno. And uh, Hera is the wife of Zeus, and she's the goddess of marriage. And uh, in my Seda class at this point, people start kind of chuckling awkwardly, who know a little bit about mythology, because it sort of sucks that she's the goddess of marriage. And the reason why is she's married to this guy, and he cheats on her constantly. A lot of the uh, tragedies and drama that happen in all of these uh, mythological stories are because of Zeus's philandering, okay? So we have these demigods that are half god, half people, and a lot of them come from Zeus having affairs with mortal women. And he has affairs with the other gods and god, with the other goddesses. He, there's lots of, lots of him sleeping around. So um, poor Hera is the goddess of marriage and her marriage is not so great. So it's kind of a bummer. Um, okay. Then we have Poseidon, his Roman name is Neptune. Um, and so Poseidon and Zeus are brothers. They have a third brother we'll talk about a little later. I'm kind of starting with the Olympians, the, the gods that live on Mount Olympus, okay? So we'll, we'll come to their third brother later because he doesn't get to live on Olympus with them. So Poseidon, Roman name Neptune, and you'll notice he looks kind of similar to Zeus, okay? So they both have kind of the, the beard thing going on, but they're super buff. Um, he's often shown with his hippocampus. These are his uh, horse whale things that, that pull him around in his chariot in the sea. He also often has his trident, which is this kind of big fork he's holding. So that's one of his attributes. Um, and he, like his brother, is the, the god of the sky. He is the, the god of the sea. So he oversees all the water, all the ocean and the sea and everything. Okay. Then we have uh, Hestia and Demeter. I put them together because um, they are portrayed very similarly. So they kind of get mixed up a lot in um, sculptural uh, representation. And sometimes you'll see little notations that say Hestia or Demeter because it's, it's uncertain which one's which. So Hestia's Roman name is Vesta. Demeter's Roman name is Cirrus. And Hestia is the goddess of the hearth. 
So um, in ancient Duomos, in ancient uh, Greek homes, okay, uh, if you dig up the hearthstone, which is, that's the stone that would be where your fireplace is in the house, okay, underneath it, you'll find a little statue um, or representation in some way of Hestia. And the thought is that burying Hestia under your hearthstone brings uh, like protection and good fortune and health and things to you and your family uh, when you're in your house. So she's kind of the uh, domestic goddess. She's uh, the goddess of hearth and home and family and that kind of thing. Um, Demeter is the goddess of grain and agriculture. So she is often shown holding what she has here, which is a cornucopia with different things that you would harvest, different fruits and vegetables and things like that. She's also sometimes shown just holding a big bushel of wheat. Um, and sometimes she is also associated with the home and with the kitchen and with cooking and with the harvest and agriculture and all of that. So these two are a little bit related. Um, and sometimes, like I said, they're just portrayed sort of similarly, especially uh, if Demeter is missing her, her bushel of wheat or her uh, cornucopia or whatever. We'll talk about um, Demeter's daughter, Persephone, in a little bit. Athena, this is my favorite goddess. So uh, Athena, whose Roman name is Minerva, she's the goddess of wisdom. She's also the goddess of war. So you can imagine she comes into play in a lot of the mythology because a lot of the things are about all these epic battles and things that happen. So Athena's pretty important. Um, and we're still in with the gods that live in on Mount Olympus. So she's one of the, the goddesses that lives up there. Um, and she is Zeus's daughter but she doesn't have a mother. So she was born from Zeus, she sprang from his head, okay? So she's kind of an interesting character and because she um, doesn't have a mother and she just sprang out of her father's head this way, uh, sort of an asexual birth, no uh, copulation involved. She's also sometimes identified with uh, virginity and purity occasionally, but she's uh, mostly portrayed in the myths and things as the goddess of war. She's also the goddess of wisdom. So oftentimes she will have a shield, a spear, a helmet, that kind of thing. Sometimes she has an owl with her because she's the goddess of wisdom. Uh, okay, uh, Ares. Ares' Roman name is Mars. And Ares is the god of war. So Athena and Ares kind of go together. She's a little bit more, oftentimes she's a lot to do more with the strategy of battle and he's more to do with the like rage, like the emotional side of battle in some ways. So he's the god of war and he is the legitimate child of Zeus because he is the son of Zeus and Hera, okay? So his parents are the king and queen of the gods, which is, makes him, you know, in a pretty prominent position. Um, he is often depicted to symbolize uh, war times, basically, when, when uh, Greek city-states are, are at war with each other or at war with someone else. He's also the lover of Aphrodite. So they are not married, but they are lovers and they're often portrayed together. And we'll talk about Aphrodite now. So this is uh, Hephaestus, whose Roman name is Vulcan, and Aphrodite, whose Roman name is Venus. Most of you have probably heard of Aphrodite. She's, I'd say, one of the most famous of the uh, goddesses. She is um, the daughter of Zeus and Diane. Diane was a uh, nymph, which is kind of a supernatural creature that's not exactly, it's not really a goddess, but it's like a, uh, nymphs were protectors of different things in nature. They're really associated with nature. So some of the nymphs are water nymphs, some forest nymphs, that kind of thing. Uh, so she's the daughter of Zeus and Diane, and she is the goddess of love and beauty. And she tends to be the, the goddess of love in like a lasting, like passionate, um, long lasting way instead of like a lustful way, which is kind of what her son Cupid represents usually. Um, okay, and then she is married to Hephaestus. So Hephaestus is her husband, and he's the god of fire, and he's the god of metalwork. He's not as famous of a god, but he's a really important one. So he is Zeus's son. I know they're siblings and they're married. There's a lot of incest here, so get ready. That's like a thing with all the gods and goddesses, lots of incest. So Hephaestus is the son of Zeus. He's married to Aphrodite um, and he made Achilles's armor. Achilles was one of the heroes in the battle of uh, Troy. He actually gets defeated there eventually, but he's kind of a big hero. Brad Pitt played him in the movie. Brad Pitt's playing you, you're pretty important. Um, 
He made Zeus's scepter, so Zeus's staff thing. That's kind of one of his symbols. He made, uh, Hephaestus made that. He made Poseidon's trident, which is the big fork that Poseidon carries. And he delivered Athena. So when Zeus has this headache and thinks something is happening, Hephaestus is the one who's able to get in and get her out of his head. So he's really important, right? Um, he has, he's kind of bitter. He's always portrayed as kind of bitter because Aphrodite is constantly with uh, Ares because that's who she loves. She does not love who she's married to, this kind of thing. Okay, then we have Apollo and Diana. So uh, Apollo's Roman name is Apollo. He's the only one who his name is the same in both. And he's the god of light and music. So he's often associated with things like the sunrise and, and the coming of light and things like this. Um, he's Zeus's son with Leto. Leto uh, was one of the Titans. So um, this kind of super, they're, relate, they're kind of like gods, but they're a little bit different. So that's his mom. He's also sometimes called Helios or Sol, which uh, is very directly related to the sun. Uh, Artemis is his sister. And she is the goddess of the hunt and wild animals and the moon. So I put them together because they're brother and sister and he's kind of the sun and she's kind of the moon. Um, she is often portrayed with a bow and arrow. Sometimes she has things like wild animals like deer particularly with her. Sometimes she is portrayed with the moon. Um, Apollo is also associated with um, horses and chariots. So you sometimes see him in a chariot driving his horses forward. Um, and sometimes he has musical instruments because he's also the god of music. Hermes, uh, his Roman name is Mercury. I couldn't find a good statue of him in which you could see his staff, his helmet, and his uh, feet. So that's why I, his winged sandals. So that's why I, I picked this uh, mosaic of him. Um, so he is uh, the son of Zeus and a nymph, and he's the messenger of the gods. So he's up on Mount Olympus a lot, but he also is kind of the go-between, between the gods and humans, between the gods and other supernatural creatures, between the gods uh, and on Olympus and the gods who live in the other areas. So he's kind of moves around a lot. Um, and he's considered the guide to travelers. Um, including the guide to travelers who are going on to the next life, who are going into the underworld. So he's sometimes kind of associated there. Um, he has winged sandals. He uh, carries the herald's rod. He wears a winged hat. So these are his kind of uh, things that you see associated with him. Um, okay, now we're going to talk about the non-Olympian gods. So these are the ones who don't live on Mount Olympus. So the, the big one is Hades. So he's the third brother. So we have Zeus, god of the sky, uh, Poseidon, god of the sea, and Hades, god of the underworld. So those are kind of, when you think about it in layers, those are like three layers of the universe, basically, in, in Greek culture. So um, Hades' uh, Roman name is Pluto. Um, he often has his kind of, it's not a trident, it's like this uh, kind of pitchfork looking thing, uh, which Hephaestus also made, I believe. And he is, um, uh, he sometimes comes up, he he's sometimes features in other stories where he isn't in the underworld, but he's pretty much always in the underworld. So he's not on Mount Olympus. That's not really a thing for him. Um, and he's the god of the dead and the lord of the underworld. Uh, Persephone, whose Roman name is uh, Pro, uh, Proserpina, and her she's sometimes called Kore also, but she's most widely known as Persephone. So this is a picture, this is a, a statue depicting Hades abducting her, okay? So sometimes this gets glossed over as this kind of romantic thing and in some of the stories it kind of is, but at first she is very unhappy. So she is Demeter's daughter, so her mom is the goddess of agriculture, um, and her dad is Zeus. So she's Zeus's daughter, meaning Hades is her uncle. Again, they don't really care about that, lots of incest in the, the gods. Um, and so she's married to Hades after he steals her, and she becomes then the queen of the underworld. Um, in terms of her goddess role, she was the embodiment of spring. So she's kind of the goddess of, of spring and of grain and of crops, which makes sense, which kind of relates to her mom. So her story is Hades falls in love with her beauty, and he uh, whisks her away to the underworld. And while she's there, she tries to not eat anything, eat or drink anything. 
because she's suspicious of, of his intentions and she wants to go back up. She's very sad. She's the goddess of spring and she's down in the underworld where there aren't any green growing things and it's kind of a bummer. Um, but she's so hungry that one day she eats six uh, pomegranate seeds. And so that binds her to the underworld. And so she has to be there for six months out of the year. So that's why we have seasons, right? So in the spring, she comes back up and she's there for spring and summer. And then she has to go back down fall and winter and be in the underworld and be the queen of the underworld with her husband, Hades. Okay. Uh, then we have um, our other non-Olympians who don't live on Olympus, but are occasionally up there. And that's uh, Dionysus, whose uh, Roman name is Bacchus. Okay, so he's the guy over here on the left. And he's the son of Zeus and a mortal. So he's technically a demi demigod, but he, he kind of um, gets promoted to, he's sort of the god of, of some things. So he's the god of wine, and he's often seen as the god of victory and celebration and, and wine. So he always has grapes or a wine cup or something like that. He often has grape leaves on his head, and this one he has full-on grapes on his head. So he's kind of the party god. He's always partying. Um, then we have uh, Asclepius. Asclepius's Roman name is Asclepius. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> they're sort of similar. They're just a little bit off. And he is the son of Apollo, so his dad is um, Apollo, who's the god of like light and music and kind of the sun. And um, uh, Asclepius is the god of healing. And you'll notice he has uh, his staff here, which is a um, staff entwined with a serpent. And that may be familiar because that is the symbol of modern medicine, right? So I include him because his symbol is something that we still see in contemporary society as like a symbol of a, a hospital or a doctor or something like that. So uh, I just include him because I think that that's kind of a neat modern tie-in. And then we have uh, Eros. So Eros uh, is also sometimes called Amor or Cupid. Amor and Cupid are his uh, Roman names. And he is the son of Aphrodite and Ares. So they're lovers, this is their son. And he is uh, the winged child god of love. But he tends to be kind of associated with um, the lusty part of love a little bit more than the lasting kind of love, okay. And he has wings and he is often shown uh, with a bow and arrow, okay. So we, we're kind of familiar with uh, his... Um, with his, sorry, my husband's sexting me. Uh, we're familiar with him, right? We kind of know his figure. In this, he's portrayed as like a young man. Oftentimes he looks like kind of like a baby or a toddler, okay? Okay, I think that is all of the gods we're gonna talk about. So let's talk just a little bit about um, ancient Greek society, okay? So um, when we think about Greece, Athens is the capital of Greece, so Athens was an important city-state at this time as well. And it's um, kind of, a, a lot of people think of it as sort of the birthplace of uh, Western civilization, okay? So it's where we have uh, Socrates is from there, Plato, Sophocles, Sappho, Euripides, all of these really important thinkers are from Athens, are from Greek, and they come about, most of them are a little bit later. They're in kind of the, um, the later classical period um, or the high classical period. So we'll talk about these people a little bit more uh, in one of the next lectures. But I just wanna kind of put us in what we think about ancient Greece being kind of important for. So we have a lot of these important thinkers. Uh, the Greeks borrow a ton from Egypt and from Mesopotamia, so we have things coming from the Fertile Crescent area, which we talked about, things coming from Egypt and Kush that we've talked about. So they are the birthplace of a lot of this um, culture and society, but they, they also borrow heavily, and they're super influenced by the Minoans, right? So we talked about the Minoans last time and their relationship with the Greek mainland. So the ancient Greeks are very important, and they're where kind of thought of as the first Western civilization, but they borrow heavily from a lot of the people that we've already talked about, and they kind of put a lot of these things together. Um, it's also oftentimes called the birthplace of democracy, um, it's, which is kind of true. They had a senate, so they elected people, and then the, the council of, of senators, of elders, uh, made choices, so it's kind of like a representative democracy kind of situation, like what we have uh, in theory in America. Um, 
But, you know, the birthplace of democracy makes it sound like everything was really good and everyone was equal and all these things. Uh, women were not considered equal. They, uh, they definitely had slaves. The Greeks had slaves um, of different, uh, from different areas around them. So democracy, kind of the seed of the idea, you know, it's not just a monarchy like most of the societies that we've seen so far but it's also not like a true democracy, right? But it's important to, to put it, to categorize it that way. So, so some important things outside of art and architecture come out of ancient Greece is the point of the slide. Some very important political ideas like uh, representative democracy, some very important written pieces, plays, poems, things like this, lots of great historians, lots of really important math, um, you know, Pythagoras and all those guys. Uh, come out of this period. So culturally, um, ancient Greece is super important. Okay, so we're going to break this down into a few periods. And in this lecture, I just wanted to do that general introduction with all the gods and things. And then we're going to talk about geometric and uh, orientalizing periods in ancient Greece. So these are kind of, um, when I left off talking about uh, Mycenae, I was talking about how at the end, we kind of go into like a dark ages where a lot of the cultural advancements and things seem to be sort of forgotten or lost. Um, and so I want to kind of pick up there and talk about what happens next. So um, the geometric and orientalizing period is uh, when we have the destruction of Mycenaean, Mycenaean uh, palaces. A lot of them are destroyed right before this. We lo lose tons of knowledge when uh, these places are, are destroyed. We looked at them last time and their ruins and some of their uh, artifacts and things, and you remember it was a very advanced society. So a lot of that is lost and we go into what's known as the Dark Age of Greece. The eighth century BC, we kind of start to come out of this darkness and start to kind of emerge. We have um, Homer, who we talked about last time. Homer's born in 750. BC and he writes very important epic poems, right? So we have the Iliad and the Odyssey. Uh, we have the Olympic Games begin in this time period and we'll look at uh, that site in Olympus um, in a little bit uh, in the next lecture. We have the return of the human figure to art. So we, we had like kind of no figurative representation for a long time. Um, and so here we have um, this is a uh, Dipolon crater. Uh, crater is the kind of vessel it is. It's the kind of pot it is. And so this would have been um, a grave marker. This would have been on someone's tomb. Um, and here we see human figures. So they're very abstracted human figures. And I like showing this. And I want you to think all the way back to the Paleolithic period and to some of the things that we were looking at, particularly in South America. We have the same kind of patterning in things here, which is really interesting. So just, just a little thing to kind of think about, the kind of collective consciousness through the ages kind of thing. So what we have here um, at the top, this is called a meander, which is also known as a uh, key pattern, okay? And so this is where we get the, the name for this period, the uh, geometric kind of period, where we have um, the meander key pattern. We also have some other kinds of geometric inspired patterning on this thing. But importantly, we also have these human figures. We also have horses and chariots. So we're starting to see some depiction that's kind of coming back into the realm of, of representation. Um, so this is a sculpture of Heracles and Nisos. Uh, so um, Nisos uh, is a centaur. A centaur is a thing from mythology that's um, half human, half horse, okay? And um, they're very good uh, archers in, in um, mythology. They tend to be good warriors, good archers. Uh, so Nisos is um, one of them, and he kidnaps uh, Daenerys. Daenerys is uh, Heracles' wife. And so Heracles shoots him with a arrow that he has dipped in the blood of a hydra. A hydra is a monster that has many heads, and when you cut off one head, more heads come up. Hydra is also, I know, uh, in the Marvel Comics universe, they're kind of the enemy of S.H.I.E.L.D. They're associated with Nazis. So they get their name, their little symbol thing, is from this, this mythological monster called the Hydra that uh, Heracles defeats 
basically. So anyway, its blood is very poisonous, and so he puts some of this Hydra blood on an arrow, and he shoots it at Mesos uh, and kills him. Um, and uh, there's more to that story because eventually um, Nisos, his blood, which is poisoned by uh, Hercules's arrow, is put on a robe that Heracles ends up wearing and then it kills him and it's a whole big tragic thing. Okay, so this is, is thought to be a depiction of Heracles and Nisos. Okay, so we have a guy here and then we have a horse guy. So that's kind of the thought, right? So this is not as sophisticated as the sculptural representation and the human representation that we've been seeing prior to this period in Egypt, in Kush, in um, uh, Crete with the Minoans. Um, you know, so this is this is a little bit, um, it's, it's a step, it feels like a step back, but they're coming out of this dark period, and so they're starting to do three-dimensional representation, so this is, this is good, right? Okay, uh, another sculpture from around this period is the Menticlos Apollo. So this is a statuette of a youth, uh, sorry for the typo there, I'm missing a T, and it's dedicated by Manticlos to Apollo. So we've seen this kind of thing um, in a lot of the other cultures that we've studied where people, remember the Cycladic statues that we thought were maybe put in tombs to pray for the deceased in their absence? We saw this in Egypt, we saw this in the Fertile Crescent. So we've seen this kind of thing, but this one is interesting because if you can see, there's writing on his legs. And so that's an actual uh, written, dedication to the god Apollo. So there's a message from the artist, which is uh, Menticlos, that's the name of the artist, and he has etched it, carved it into the, the thighs of this figure um, in support of Apollo. So it's kind of a dedicational figure, like those statuettes, but this one has a particular inscription. Okay, we're going to look at some other kinds of uh, pottery. I think that pottery is something that we really um, associate with the Greeks, rightfully so. There's a long, long history of vase painting and of pottery construction. And when you think about how beautiful and perfectly made these things are, that they still exist, that they're thousands and thousands and thousands of years old is pretty cool. So just to give a little bit of um, kind of general terminology here, an amphora, which is what this is, is a two-handled uh, vessel, a two-handed handled ceramic jar that's used for wine or oil. And so it tends to have a narrower um, top, so it, it sort of bul comes out, it bulges out, and then it comes closer together. And sometimes they have lids. And the reason it comes closer together is to keep the wine from evaporating quickly, right? Um, then you also have uh, craters, K-R-A-T-E-R, and that's a wide-mouthed vessel, a wider-mouthed bowl, and it's used for mixing wine with water. So um, a lot of times wine would be diluted with water to be uh, consumed by like children, things like that. Um, okay, so we have this one, which is um, a black figure amphora, another typo, I'm sorry, I'm missing the O from amphora there. So black figure just refers to the fact that the figures are painted on here in black. They have some red as well. Red figure is kind of a separate thing that we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, so this is about a foot high and it's decorated with these kind of patterns but also with these animal figures. And the animals are really interesting looking because they're very, very stylized. So we see um, this is categorized as a uh, orientalizing uh, style. Uh, the re what orientalizing as a style means is that it's taking some influence from the Near East, so from uh, Persia, right, from that area, from the Fertile Crescent area. And the reason this uh, is categorized that way is if you look at some of these creatures, we have uh, Lamassu, which remember we talked about Lamassu when we were talking about the Fertile Crescent, and we have Sphinxes, uh, okay. So we have, uh, and we also have um, sirens. The sirens are the, the bird woman, so it's a bird with a woman's head. So these are all mythological creatures that are associated with the Far East, the Orient, so it's called orientalizing as part of its, uh, as, as the style that it's associated with. Okay, we're going to go into the Archaic period, um, and then we're going to stop, and then I will record a separate 
lecture for the other things later so that these aren't super, super long. Okay, so the word archaic is kind of interesting. You've maybe heard the word archaic before. Today we kind of use it as an adjective to um, mean that something is outdated. If you say that's very archaic, it means like, why are you using, uh, you know, Windows 2 or something, or why are you using a flip phone from 2001 uh, that's 20 years old? So archaic now kind of, it tends to have a negative connotation and it tends to mean something that is no longer relevant or is outdated. Um, but it's also an art, this period in ancient Greece that's kind of coming out of the, the dark ages again. So that's this, we had a little bit of the geometric orientalizing art starting to happen. And then the archaic period is where it really starts to get going. So it basically is just the period before we get into the true classical Greek um, architecture, sculpture and, and artworks that um, ancient Greece is really known for, like what we really think of when we think of ancient Greece. So the archaic period is the period right before that. And one of the ways that a lot of the art uh, has been described and is still described sometimes is uh, Daedalic art. So Daedalic, if you remember in the prehistoric Aegean lecture, I talked about uh, Daedalus, if anyone remembers who that was. Daedalus is the guy who worked for King Minos. He's the one who made the labyrinth to contain the Minotaur. He has another legend that is pretty famous. He's So he's an inventor and a sculptor and an architect and kind of a genius guy. And uh, his son is Icarus. And they're being held by Minos against their will, basically. But he keeps them there because he wants Daedalus to make things for him. And so he decides he and his son are going to flee, so he makes wings for them. And he holds the wings together with wax. All the feathers are attached with wax. And so he and his son Icarus fly with their wings out of their tower, where they're captive. And he warns Icarus not to fly too close to the sun, or the sun will melt his wax and his wings, and he will fall into the sea and die. Well, Icarus is a teenager, so he does exactly what his dad tells him not to, and he's having so much fun flying that he flies too close to the sun, and the sun melts his wings, and he falls into the ocean and dies. So that's the other uh, big myth that's associated with Daedalus. But the reason that we're talking about him right now has <laughs> nothing to do with that. Um, it's this, this kind of style within the archaic period. And this is something that we get from Greek writers. And they describe Daedalus as getting a lot of his compositional ideas and patterns from the Egyptians, okay? So he's also a sculptor. He's an inventor and an artist, an architect, a sculptor. And so as a sculptor, he uses a lot of the compositional patterns and things, um, particularly uh, in his statues that he found from the Egyptians. So this work that looks a little bit Egyptian gets called Daedalic art, okay? So um, here we have, uh, there's different um, portrayals. These are usually sculptural portrayals of young men or young women. So we have uh, Koros or Kore, that's uh, a youth. The plural is uh, Koroi or Kore. Um, and the Daedalic style is hallmarked by these triangular kind of head shapes, very flat faces. Um, and this sort of Egyptian looking kind of posturing. Okay, so this is called the Lady of Azure. That's where she was found. We don't know if she's a goddess or if she's supposed to be a Kore, which is just a young woman. Uh, okay, so let's look at some more of these things and look a little closer at this idea of the Daedalic kind of the Egyptian influence in the archaic period. Um, so this is just a comparison. So here's a Koros. Koros is a, a male youth. Um, from 600 BC, carved out of marble, and this is what we would call the Daedalic style, in that it's taken some patterning and posturing from the Egyptians. And then let's look at this uh, sculpture of Mentumhet, who, that we, we looked at uh, when we talked about Egypt. I think one of you wrote about this sculpture, actually, in the discussion. Um, so pretty similar, right? It's not that far off to think that this is definitely uh, an influence, kind of standing the same way, same kind of set shoulders, same very stiff like fists at the side. Um, similarly, uh, kind of patterning in uh, the hair on this side that looks sort of like the headdress on the other side. Similar kind of um, severe features, though this one's features look a little different than this one's, right? Uh, this one has a little bit of an influence, kind of a Persian influence to it. So you can see that this, what I'm talking about, this Daedalic style being the influence in the archaic period in Greece of Egyptian work, right? Okay, so let's look at a couple more examples. Um, so this is 
Uh, the calf bear, the Greek word for calf bear is Moshephoros, Foros, sorry, and it is dedicated by Rhombus. So one of the things that's kind of interesting is on some of these, we're not sure if it's the artist or if it's the person who commissioned it, but we have little dedications, so we have some people's names. So you can see the similarity here as well. So this guy is holding a cow, holding a calf but you can see the way his hair is styled. You can see um, the kind of way he has sort of a triangular sort of uh, figure, his shoulders to waist. You can see he's very stiff. He's kind of standing in a similar way. So you can still see this kind of influence, right? Okay, and so uh, we also have uh, sculptures of, of young women at this time. And so this one's called the Peplos Kore. Um, Peplos is a garment. It's named after a guy from a myth who we'll talk about a little bit later, but a peplos is a garment generally worn by women, so it's kind of funny that it's named after a man, but it's a long belted kind of dress, okay? So it's kind of an everyday thing that you'd wear. Uh, Kori is a young woman, Kori is the plural. Um, and women at this time in the archaic period are always clothed they're always portrayed as as clothed wearing clothing and men are nude which is not always but almost always nude which is kind of a strange thing so we have this interesting kind of thing happening in terms of what is acceptable to be portrayed okay um and then we have uh on some of these sculptural pieces, they are set at, at cemeteries, they are set at grave sites, either as kind of mourners or as tributes to those who died, as portrayals of those who died. Um, and so this one, the uh, Korsos, is um, a sculpture of a young man, and it is engraved on the plinth, that's the, the uh, stand, the thing at the bottom that he's standing on is called a plinth, and it's inscribed, stay and mourn at the tomb of dead Korsos, whom raging Ares destroyed one day as he fought in the foremost ranks. So this is a young man who was a soldier and he was fighting in a battle and he was killed. And it's kind of an interesting thing because they're talking about um, the rage of Ares, of Ares, right? And, and kind of this negative connotation, which is pretty interesting because it's kind of challenging this who's one of their gods, which is kind of an interesting thing. So um, you can see in these that although this sculpture is similar to this one, we can see kind of the, the influence of this uh, Daedalic kind of Egyptian style, it's starting to get more naturalistic, right? It's starting to soften a little bit. We're seeing more realistic portrayal of musculature, that kind of thing. We're seeing a little bit of softening on those facial features and making them look a little bit more realistic. Okay. Um, so this is another sculpture uh, from, this is a Kore from the Acropolis in Athens. And this is just a, kind of to give you some, some of the names for some of the, the clothing that the women are portrayed wearing. So peplos is a long belted garment. It's kind of like a dress. The Ionian uh, chithin is the tunic made of linen. So it's, it's pretty light. And then, and that goes over the dress sometimes, or it's worn by itself, and then over it is a uh, hemation, which is a, a mantle, it's the kind of wrapped piece on top, and it's worn over the tunic, it's a little heavier material, usually made out of some kind of wool. So these are just some of the clothing things that are worn at the time, this is sort of 6th century BC fashion, so we see a lot of our kori uh, depicted wearing these kind of things. Also notice her hair, this is a very elaborate kind of braided hairdo that is going on and very large earrings. These would have been painted, so this has some of the paint left on it. The paint changed color as it aged over time and some of it was just completely worn away. So when we think about, at least when I think about ancient Greece, I think of all these perfect like white marble statues. They were painted, so that is not the case. So it's kind of interesting to think about what these things would have uh, actually looked like. Okay, so uh, this is called the Francois vase, and this is a vase who we know who made it. So we have uh, Cletius and Ergodemus, and one of them would have been the potter, the person who made the pot, and the other would have been the painter who painted the pot. And those are, are separate professions. Some people do both things. They do the potting and the painting, but they're very respected. Um, professions at this time and artists start signing their work which is kind of interesting 
because um, we start having more and more artist names at this time, which remember up to this point, we, on we only have like a few. We have Imhotep, we have a couple of people, but um, we start seeing more and more artist names and they're signing the pottery in kind of a prominent way. So this is kind of early branding, okay? So there'd be people who collected pottery from a specific person and they wanted only pottery that had been painted by Cletius, for example. So they'd look for that signature, which we haven't seen that before. So this is the first time we start having, start having uh, artists, not just architects, but artists who have particular followings and people really wanting their work. And we see evidence of that in that they're signing their work. Okay. Oh, and notice on here we're getting uh, a little bit away from from the um, geometric kind of patterning. We still have uh, kind of simplified figures, but they're they're becoming more detailed. We're starting to see a little bit more realistic things. Um, the way that this is fired, the way that they achieve this is kind of interesting. So there, it's a three phase firing process. So the first is oxidizing, turning the pot and the design red. So that's firing it in a fire with oxygen, and that turns it red. And then there's the reducing period, which is firing it and cutting off the air, and that turns the, uh, the, the pot and the design totally black. And then re-oxidizing turns the coarser material, the coarser clay that's, uh, that the pot is made out of, red because it absorbs some of the oxygen back but the really fine uh, silt that's used to paint on the slip painting uh, of the design is too fine and the oxygen can't get back into it so it remains black so it's a pretty clever process that they figured out how to do this okay let's look at a couple more examples so this is by a very famous um, potter from the time so he's a painter um, we think he also made his pots, because uh, generally it's just his signature on his pots, but he was definitely a painter. Um, and he's kind of the most famous guy of the black figure painting. So there's different kinds of vase painting, and black figure painting is one of the very prominent ones in the archaic period. And his name is Ezekius. So we have Ezekius, and this is a painting of Achilles and Ajax. Achilles and Ajax are both heroes of the Trojan War, okay? So um, they are, are known as these um, very heroic warriors, battle figures. So this is kind of an interesting motif because instead of them doing something that they're famous for, like killing people in battle, they're just kind of hanging out, right? They're hanging out and playing a dice game. Um, so it's kind of these heroes relaxing together in a leisurely activity, which is a sort of humanizing thing, um, and it becomes a it becomes a really popular motif. Okay, <laughs> it gets copied a lot from uh, Ezekiel. People really like this motif, and I think it's because it's putting these heroes in kind of a relatable, more humanizing kind of uh, view. Um, so then we also have this painter called uh, Andokides. And he's pretty neat um, because you can see in each of these images, it's the front of the pot and the back of the pot. So what you notice is the images are the inverse of each other. So it's the same image, but in one it's painted um, in red and one it's painted in black. And so this was called bilingual painting. So one side all the uh, figures are done in red and the other side they're done in black. And this was kind of the height of sophistication in terms of pottery painting at this time. Um, quite a few of these exist, and quite a few of these exist from this painter and are signed, and they're in pretty good condition and are pretty fantastic. So it's kind of neat to see them. So we have in the middle here the same motif that we had before, and copied pretty, uh, not a lot of variance there, a teeny bit of variance, but not a whole lot. So we have uh, Achilles and Ajax playing a, a dice game. As, as I said, this becomes a very popular motif that gets copied a lot. And then we have um, uh, Heracles, and he's kind of laying out on a couch uh, during a banquet with Athena. Athena's our goddess of war and wisdom. She, she really liked uh, Heracles. She kind of helped him out some. Um, we'll talk about their relationship a little bit more later. And then uh, here we have a, a, do, 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 do. who is over here? We have Heracles on his couch. Oh, we have uh, Heracles over here as well, and he is um, driving a bull to sacrifice. So he's like 
getting this bull to go forward to be sacrificed. So here he's sacrificing a bull, here he's hanging out with Athena and a youth being served wine. Okay. Um, another famous uh, painter at this time is uh, Euphronius. So Euphronius um, is the kind of most famous guy for red figure painting. This is kind of bleached over time, so it doesn't look as red as it would have originally. Um, but you can see this is a very detailed portrayal. He's starting to think about, they're starting to think a little bit more about perspective and about ideas of human anatomy. Um, and so we have uh, Heracles wrestling Antaeus here, and you can just see that this is depicted in red on a black field. There's also, it's polychromatic. You can see that there's a little um, bit of green in the, the kind of headpiece here. There's a little bit of green around um, the crater itself in the decoration. So they're kind of branching out into a little more color at this point. Uh, this one is really interesting because, as I said before, we don't have uh, women portrayed in the nude at this time. And if they are partially nude, it's Aphrodite, it's a goddess, right? And even she at this time is portrayed pretty much covered up. So this is a really interesting thing. This is uh, by the painter uh, Onesimos. And this is a girl preparing to bathe. So this is um, a cup, kind of looks like a chalice. And on the inside, in the bottom of the cup, is where this is portrayed. So it's kind of hidden inside the cup. Um, and that's because it's kind of controversial, OK? So we have uh, a kylix. That's what a drinking cup is called. And this is important for a few reasons. One of them is just the way it's portrayed. So we have fairly successful foreshortening. So it really looks like she's turned in a three-quarter pose. And um, everything looks fairly accurate in terms of foreshortening and perspective. And then we have a nude woman, and this isn't, this is a servant girl, this is like a, a normal girl. So um, her being nude and portrayed this way is very unusual for the time, it's super unusual. You can see we still have that meander pattern, that, that uh, key pattern from the geometric style is still kind of coming into some of this work. So this is pretty interesting. Um, so we're lastly just gonna talk about architecture during the archaic a little bit and then uh, we will go into um, then we'll stop this lecture and then the next time we'll talk about the classical periods okay so the first thing to understand um, about architecture at this period and this continues in through the classical periods of ancient Greece are these different orders okay so at this time we have the Doric and we have the Ionic um, later, we'll also have uh, Corinthian and Composite, but for right now, we're just going to deal with Doric order and Ionic order. And I find this slide very handy. It's a very helpful way that it breaks down all of these different um, vocabulary and things. So um, the Doric order, one of the easiest ways to pick these things out is to look at the columns. If the column down here at the bottom has just a plain capital, the top of, of the column where it comes up, it's plain, it doesn't have any swirls, it doesn't have any decorations, it's probably a Doric order building. Whereas if you look at the Ionic order, it has these swirls, right? We call those uh, volutes, okay? So the, um, the abacus is the, the top little part of the capital, and in uh, an Ionic order, that generally has some decoration. In a Doric order, it's very plain, okay? And then there's differences um, in the way you continue up the building as well. So um, you have basically what well, we're going to look at a lot of temples. So you have the steps that go up to the temple, and it's kind of this platform that the whole thing is built on. That's called the stylobate. We have that in all of our orders. Then you have your columns, and the column is broken down into um, the shaft and the capital. Some orders also have a base. So the base is at the very bottom, as you can see on the Ionic order. That's another difference. On the Doric order, there's no base. The columns connect directly to the stylobate. So you have uh, the column. Doric columns can be fluted, meaning they have kind of the little stripes, or they can be smooth. Ionic columns are always fluted, um, if they're following the order correctly. Then you get up to the uh, capital, which is the top part of the column. And again, we have the plain Doric one. We have the uh, ionic one with volutes. Then you get up into the entablature. So in the entablature on the Doric order, uh, 
and the ionic order, the main uh, part that we're going to look at is the frieze. And in the frieze is where we oftentimes have lots of relief sculpture depicting uh, gods, goddesses, heroes, stories uh, from mythology. But that's broken down a little bit. In the Doric order, we have what are called triroglyphs, which are these little points of fluting that separate out the panels in the frieze. Um, we also have the, the metope, which is the space right between those. Um, in the Ionic Order, we have kind of these three lines kind of leading up, these three channels. Sometimes those have sculpture, not often. Mostly it's in the frieze. And then the, the uh, layer that sticks out above the frieze is the cornice. And the cornice is the bottom of the pediment. So the triangle thing on the front of a temple, that's called the pediment, okay? And within the pediment, we have our raking cornice and we have our regular corn cornice, okay? So this just kind of breaks down these two different styles and we'll see examples of both of these styles. Ooh, that's a little bit blurry, sorry about that. So this is a, a floor plan of a typical um, temple from the archaic period. And this changes as we move forward into the classical. But basically, you have, um, you have columns all the way around. Those black dots are columns, okay? And uh, we call those flank columns, or we call those pterons, okay? P-T-E-R-O-N. They're sitting on top of the stylobate. That is the platform with the steps going up to it that everything is built on top of. It's kind of the foundation. Then uh, in front of the entrance, we have what's called the anta. That's basically the, the space between the columns and where you go into the actual tentle. Uh, temple. Um, in the uh, when you step inside um, between the anta and the the inside space, you have usually in this order two columns. When we're in the archaic time period, those are called columns in antas. Then you have the um, apistodomus. That's kind of uh, a, a space um, that is right like when you walk in from the, the antechamber from that area. The main center place is called the cella or the naos. Naos um, looks a little bit similar to the word nave, which we talk about later when we get into the Romanesque and we get into all of the um, cathedral structures. Um, up here in the front, we have uh, the proneos. So this is kind of the entranceway. These things look... Uh, when you walk up to one, it looks similar on all sides, but we have the anta is the back, the proneos is the front. And then you have um, the front colonnade, the back colonnade, which are called the peristyle or just called the colonnade. Okay, so that's the typical kind of layout. Lots of good vocabulary words in here, so you might want to make a note of these. Um, and then we're going to look at this temple as an example. So this is Temple of Hera 1. That's because there's a, there's a second later Temple of Hera that's very nearby. And this is in Paestrum, Italy. Uh, it was built around 550 BC. And it's an example of early Doric. And one of the ways that you can tell that, even though it's largely in ruin, we don't have the pediment, we don't have the frieze, is you can see up these fluted columns up at the top to the capital, and it's just kind of a plain capital. There aren't any volutes, there aren't any, isn't any um, decor at the top, right? Um, also inside this, we have a center row of columns which uh, we don't see in our plan, but some of the archaic uh, structures have a center row of columns that goes right down the middle. Uh, later, when we look at classical, there'll be two rows of columns inside. So um, that's kind of the only thing that we see. Uh, we only see that particular style in the archaic. So this is the plan for Hera 1. So you can see we have our anta, we have our porch, uh, the ambulatory is the area between the peristyle or colonnade and the, temp the main part of the temple. And then inside our cella or naos, we have that single row of columns, which is, if you find that you're in the archaic period, that's the only time they did that. Okay, so next time we're going to start here. We're going to look at the transition to the classical period, and then we're going to look at the classical periods, um, early classical and high classical. Uh, maybe late classical, but we might split that into a third uh, lecture because there's just a lot of information to cover. So I will talk to you next time.